right. So, uh, John Dean, Terry King, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me and Jonathan. We were very keen to get a bit of time with you guys just to understand a little bit about how really that your journeys were weaved together by the Holy Spirit that ended up leading to the birth of AIM, which many of us have connected to and are benefiting from. And so we got a few questions that we we want to put to you guys, but we can flow with it in whatever direction it goes. And we might do this over a number of uh, Zoom calls and hopefully it will be of benefit and an encouragement to, to others as well. So um, if I kick off with the, the first question, just kind of understand a little bit of your individual journeys. The question I've got is how did God first make himself known to you? That first experience or that that point where what you might have known in your head becomes real in your life. So, Terry, could I put that to you first? Yeah. Um, I mean, John, and I have very different stories and very both of us are different from the typical evangelical uh, journey. Um, I was raised as a United Methodist. My family is Methodist back from 14 generations. And uh, so I always heard about the gospel. In fact, I remember once as a young person, maybe 12, 11, 12, they sang a song, Redeem, Redeem, How I Love to, to, to Proclaim It. And I asked my youth leader, what, is, what does that mean, redeemed? I never heard that word before. And he explained to me the gospel, and I agreed, but that's all I knew. And it wasn't until several years later, I was uh, just about 15, almost 16, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And guys, that's when Jesus became so real, so personal, so intimate. Sometimes his presence, uh, scary. I mean, like, I, I didn't want to turn around because I knew I might see him. And, and so for, for me, that, that experience of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, um, I, 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 knew, I knew nothing, nothing at all. But uh, when, when he touched me that night, um, in fact, when I, when I kind of came around, uh, it's interesting that the, the preacher asked me to go pray with someone else after I kind of started kind of slowing down a little bit. And I did, and that went on for a while. When I finally finished, the whole building was empty. The only person left was the one who, who brought us. So it was really a supernatural experience that, uh, that, 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 that has kind of set the benchmark for the presence of God. And so was the Holy Spirit operational within the Methodist Church at that time, or was that kind of out of the blue what you experienced? Yeah, I, didn't, I, never, I never was taught against it, but I never was taught about it. So it was, this is 66, 65, 66. I mean, the charismatic movement, I guess, had begun, but it had not begun yet to really touch the Methodist Church. And so for me, it was, I never heard of anything against it or, 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 or never taught about it. And, and from that moment, Terry, the, your eyes were open to a relationship that you had, had never comprehended to that point. What, what did you do with yourself? Well, the, the preacher gave me a couple of words of advice. He said, number one, pray this, this, this language. You have a new language. All of the time. All of the time. Uh, and I remember sitting one day in algebra class thinking, this is so boring. And under my breath, I started speaking in tongues. And I kind of laughed to myself and said, I bet there's no one has ever spoken in tongues in algebra class before. <laughs> and secondly, it began to open my eyes to, to really look for the leading of the Holy Spirit. What comes next in my life? Where should I go? What should I do? And uh, that's another that's another whole story. That's great. So that the spiritual world opened up. And that's John Dean's been a very important part of, of that, really. Uh, actually going to another whole branch, another whole level of, of walking in that other realm of, of the Spirit. So, but okay. it all goes back to that experience being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, let, let's get uh, kind of what's going on with John John's story, and then we'll see how they, the two weave together. So, John, can you give us a, a, an overview of your your starting journey. 
well, my story uh, seems to come in uh, in segments. Uh, when I was, I didn't find out until years later that my uh, father's family, uh, when they migrated to Texas back in 1845, um, they were all Baptists. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, great-grandmother, or grandmother, rather, on that side, they were all uh, Church of Christ. And uh, so I did not realize this until I was grown because my father died when I was three. <clears throat> and, uh, and then my stepfather, obviously, he did not go to church, didn't know anything about church. But I remember when I was five years old, I seemed to know the Lord because I I remember putting on a little suit that somebody had given us, and we lived in a hall, lived in a hotel in Houston, and I, I went out there in the hotel room and gathered all the other little kids <clears throat> and started preaching to them. And we didn't go to church, uh, nothing. And uh, so uh, I it just I just did it. And and I, I remember telling them that they didn't have to worry about going to hell because they were not 12 years old. So when they get 12 years old, they need to worry about it. And, get, and so and that was, I don't know where in the world I got that from. And then skip ahead. When I was 12 years old, uh, we lived on a river. We had moved and lived on a river with my stepfather in a tent. Back in those days, people were poor and in a tent. And uh, I was sitting, I went across the river, sat on a rock, and when I did, God seemed to appear to me. I did not know God. And he, I didn't see him, but he was there. I knew he was there. And he spoke to me and gave him a call then and told me what I was supposed to do. And, and the only thing I knew how to say was, yes, sir. And he left. I didn't get saved until um, I was grown, even though I I continually thought about those two events in my life, when I was grown, I went to the bank one day to, uh, to cash a check, and there was a man in the line next to me. He turned and looked at me and bowed his head and began to cry. And... Um, I didn't know what he was crying about. I didn't know the man, but but his face, I I could not get over his face. And uh, I went home that day, and I think it was the next day, a lady was praying about three blocks from my house, a long block, and she was on her knees at her couch praying. This is her story. And she said, Lord, I've never done anything in my life worthwhile. And would you let me do one great thing before I died? She was crying. And the Lord gave her a number and said, go to this number on this house and there will be a young man that will come to the door and you tell him that I love him. And at the time, I... Uh, I lived three long blocks from her. She didn't know me, and I didn't know her. But she came running up the stair, up the up the street, and found my a number. I knocked on my door, and I went to the door. It was me, and she said, "God loves you." I said, "Thank you." Shut the door. The next day, uh, she came up there, knocked on the door again, and she said, "God loves you." And I said, "I heard you yesterday." And she left, came back. And like, this happened for three weeks. <clears throat> and, that, and 
Every day she would knock on my door at the same time. Well, I didn't realize till later uh, that the man at the bank was praying for me at the same time. And so I don't want to make this as short as possible, but uh, after three weeks, I got up one morning with a terrible urge to go to church. And I got in my car, I went to the first church, and I could actually prophetically see that they had more problems than I had. So I went to the next church, the next church, the next church. Ended up all the way across town at a little church, a little hole in this church. And, um, and I just felt like God said, go in there. So I went in there. Make a long story short, that's where the man at the bank went to church, and that's where this woman went to church. And that morning, I got saved. Oh, my goodness. Praise God. Wow. And that afternoon, I went to ministry. And started and saving the, people, getting people saved. Did the man teach a Sunday school class or something like that? The man taught a Sunday school class when they... Um, the preacher, when they got up and said, okay, let's go to our Sunday school classes. And I just got up and, and followed people my age into the Sunday school class. And the first person I saw was the man standing at the blackboard. He was a teacher, the same man at the bank. He turned and looked at me, didn't say a thing, but turned about his head and prayed again, thanking God that I had, uh, God had answered his prayer. So anyway. And was that the same time when you when they when they get the altar call, altar call and called you out? Yeah, that that <laughs> uh, I went out and sat on the back row, and uh, uh, the preacher came out, black hair, black suit, and red eyes. He was an evangelist preacher, and he prayed for the lost all the time. And he was rough. Uh, when he got through preaching the message, he said, sit down. Then he said, stand up. No, he said, stand up. So we stood up and he said, this is your last chance. And I was holding on to, nobody made a sound because, you know, it was a small church and everybody knew who the center was. And it was me. <laughs> And and so everybody's real quiet. He said, I said, this is your last chance. And my heart was not in it. I'm telling you the truth. My feet started walking. I felt like I was leaning back and going this way. My feet was walking, but <laughs> my head was not in it. And I went and I knelt at the altar. And as soon as I knelt at the altar, people gathered around me, started beating on my head, save him, Lord, save him, Lord. <laughs> and I thought, if he hits me one more time. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I I prayed a simple prayer. The only prayer I knew how to pray, I said, Lord, make me like these people. And I thought, make me like these people. These people are crazy. And so anyway, they all got up and left. And the preacher said, boy, stand up. Give testimony. Testify. I didn't know what testify meant. That's, all, that's what you do in jail. So I, so I, I, I stood up and I said, sir, he said, tell the people what happened. And I turned around and I looked on the second row, I believe it was, at the woman my neighbor lady three blocks away from where I lived. Both those people went to the same church and she just smiled as if I got you. And uh, her and that man actually prayed me into that church. And I came to the Lord and I was so converted. I was so converted that I went out and immediately began to witness and win people to the Lord immediately. A man pulled up at 
at the red light, tax cab. I went out there and won him to the Lord. He went and got his family and brought them back, and I won them to the Lord. And so I've been hot ever since. So that's my story. Amen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so so John, you when you had an urge to be in church, you found a church, but yet when there was the call for the altar, you you weren't no, ready, but your heard. feet were ready. No. I, 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 I seemed to know God. I wasn't necessarily wanting to go to church. Because when I was five, I, I told you, I preached the message, but I didn't think that had anything to do with church. Right. And when I was 12, I got the call, but that didn't have anything to do with church. That had to do with you know, to go doing what God told me to do, which was really winning my family. Mm. And, mm. Uh, and so, and so when these people prayed for me, then I, um, then I got the urge to go to church that morning. It had come on the day before, just that morning. Mm. And uh, then the Holy Spirit led me past all these other churches to that one church so that's where i got the urge and the the guy that was in the the queue at the bank had he ever seen you before or was he just filled with compassion the moment he saw you he had never seen me before supernatural he had never seen me before and i had never seen him before but he was he was a righteous man oh my he was a righteous man had a deformed face and uh so he was a very quiet man, but he had become the Sunday school teacher in that church. And he prayed earnestly all the time because that's what the preacher did. The preacher prayed all the time and he went out and witnessed all the time and prayed and, and cried all the time for the lost. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where I got this, this urge to save the lost. Because first thing he told me uh, when I got saved, uh, it was next Sunday, I think it was, boy, you need to know how to pray. I said, yes, sir. So we would meet every week, and we he would teach me how to pray. I don't know that he taught me uh, as we teach each other today. I mean, he'd get out on the floor, and he'd pray, and he'd cry, oh, Lord. And so I'd go down on the floor and I'd pray, oh, Lord. <clears throat> and he'd crawl around and just cry. So I'd crawl around and just cry. And everything he did, I did. And I guess I've been doing it ever since. And what, what was the most noticeable change in your behavior after, you, after that day? Well, I wasn't the same man. Nobody knew me. They nobody knew me. Uh, the workers that I, where I worked at the time, they didn't know me. They didn't know what to do because I I, I was I was so completely different. It's kind of like the Evan Roberts story over the Wells. The people I, I was so completely different. I mean, I didn't really, didn't even hardly know myself. That's how much I was transformed. And uh, so up until that point, even though I had gotten the call from God, even up until that point, I was kind of a rascal. And, uh, and, uh, but God so transformed me. And uh, some of my friends didn't, well, all of my friends, they didn't want to be around me because I was so different. Mm. So, anyway. so then how did you guys end up overlapping? You had your your origin story in terms of where God met with you. You were both called to ministry in different parts of the country, working in different fields. Uh, Terry, from your perspective, how did 
How did you and John end up being entwined together? Well, I think there's a couple, two words that to me are very important. I think of the beginnings of the aim. And we've seen it already, supernatural. John's conversion was supernatural. It wasn't read a book. It wasn't uh, go down the one, two, three steps. It was supernatural. When I was touched by the Holy Spirit, I felt rivers of living water. I didn't even know it was in the Bible. Uh, uh, it was supernatural. And then sovereignty. The, the, the sovereign way that God has brought us our, our paths across. And the story was pretty, pretty simple. I uh, When I came back from the Philippines, I lived in the Philippines for four years. I prayed, Lord, help me meet the men with whom I can walk for the rest of my life. I've always had this longing for co covenant relationships. And I, I had them when I lived here the first time, but I lost them when I, when I went overseas. For the most part, we, there was no internet in those days, and uh, it was just a much a different, different, different time. And uh, I had been asked by a friend uh, to, to to preach in a conference at his church nearby in Maryland, about an hour away. And he was part of a network of pastors, and uh, he he was uh, kind of recruiting, kind of kind of bring other pastors into this network, and. Uh, so I uh, I agreed to preach, and uh, it was like a three day meeting. And then after a couple of weeks, he called me back. He said, "I got another guy who's coming through the area, and the the guy that is building his network called me and asked us if he could join us for the for the conference. Is that okay with you?" I said, "Well, it's your conference. You can ask whoever whoever you want." And uh, it turned out to be John. And and actually this time Karen was a, was a, was with him. Often, Carrie did not, did not travel with him because of her other responsibilities. But this time, it was Linda and I and Karen and John together for, for three days. And uh, I mean, I, I, maybe John can tell the story better than I. It was supernatural. From the very first meeting, I preached, he finished. He preached, I finished. It's like we could, split, we could, we could, we could swap places right in the middle of the sermon. He would prophesy. And 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 I would and I would preach and back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it, again, it was a sovereign the way the Lord brought us together. It was obvious from the beginning that that I mean, John, much older than I, much more experienced than I. We worked together as 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 a team, as as a peer team. And uh, the, the 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 supernatural released in the process was just amazing, just amazing. As we finished, we kind of said to each other, "This was really good." We need to do this together some together sometime again, and you know you count the cost when you're when you're traveling full time. Uh, they don't necessarily give you a double offering when there's two preachers. <laughs> um, and John was in Texas, I'm in Maryland, but but from that time we began traveling together all over the world. All, in fact, our next trip was to Ecuador, and we went to Germany, to Bulgaria, etc. But that's that 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 underlying sovereignty of the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the the, the obedience. And uh, and 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 the the, the, sign, the significant way the Holy Spirit worked between us, over and over, uh, and still does. Right. Uh, Terry, what year was it that you both ended up at the conference together? That would have been about nineteen ninety four. I, I I first returned from the Philippines in ninety three, so somewhere around ninety three, ninety four, ninety five. And the prayer that you had prayed to God, let me meet the man that I will. Amen. I pray, Lord, please help me find the men with whom I can walk for the rest of my life. I mean, there are many friends you have for, for a period, but I was hungry for covenant. More than just friendship, but true covenant relationships. And you don't need many for that. Two or three, you're a rich man. And... Uh, uh, the other guy who was eventually joined us and walked with us for many years as a part of the founder of family being was was one of those guys. But John Dean was really was really the, the first. And here we are. I can't count a lot. Almost almost thirty years later, mm -hmm. still walking together in covenant. And uh, and John, from from your perspective, uh, you meet this young dashing Terry King at a conference. Did you immediately think this guy's got something that that complements what God's given me, or 
was did did you see it before it happened or you realized why it was happening well as a person i was i was different i i, I can look back and, and and see that i was different because i was I was very vertical. I mean, I just just <laughs> got got all the time, and uh, just uh, uh, almost to the point of not needing anybody, because I I, I was I was following the, uh, the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and and there's nothing wrong with it. Well, no, that that's good. I was following the Holy Spirit, but I was so vertical. And I think that God says you need some balance in your life. Uh, I, even, even though I had built churches and networks up until that point, I was still so vertical. And 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 the Lord, uh, I, I think, supernaturally uh, brought Terry into my life because Terry was looking for a relationship, and I was had my head in the cloud all the time, and and. And the Lord uh, brought Terry in my life to bring a balance in my life because, you know, Jesus uh, uh, had favor both with man and God. And so I was not wrong. I was just probably imbalanced. And so Terry became uh, that balancing rod in my life, and when we met and worked so well at that conference, uh, I didn't realize then, but but the Lord said uh, uh, was saying, "Okay, now this this is the balancing rod." And the more as we worked together, the more I, I became this way rather than just just this way. Now, if you got to be one way or the other. That's a good way to be, uh, mm -hmm. but 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 the Lord wants us to have favor with both man and God, and so consequently, I feel like that I have become much better off because of uh, of Terry, and and uh, it just worked. It just worked. Uh, I I tend to be independent. <clears throat> Uh, I tend um, to be one of those that I can make it on my own. I, I, re, I refuse to bend to, and and I, I I tend to to go that direction, but because of of Terry, uh, it, it 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 has brought up a needed balance that I can have a different level of compassion and help. Uh, for my brother and sisters out there, and it's not that I didn't before, but it was different. Does that make sense? Mm. It, 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 it was different. I, I've always been a compassionate person, but this type of compassion was different. Uh, so by now, by nature, a healer too, and so it it looks like it's a contradiction, but it isn't. You know, I you know. So, John, did you find you had to make some intentional decisions in order to walk in that kind of partnership with Terry? It almost feels like Terry was looking for you, but you weren't really looking for him at this stage, and so it was almost more of a journey for you to embrace. Terry than Terry to embrace you in that sense. Well, I, I didn't have to make any any decisions um, because it was so supernaturally natural. And um, that's exactly right. <clears throat> if if I had to have made a decision, I probably would not have made it. But because it was supernaturally natural, and the Lord knew what I was. And who I was, it just it was it was it was it was a marriage. It was just it's just one of those things that that was supposed to be there, and it was there. And it was amazing because we were so different. 
there's an age difference, there's a background difference. Um, and, and my my hunger for horizontal, I didn't even know that word. John gave me that word. Often that's what he's done. I've had the vision, I've had the scriptures, but John would give the right vocabulary. And it really wasn't so much because I was spiritual. Uh, I was I was living in a, the fear of God. I watched several pastors fall into sin. Three of my first pastors fell into sin and the damage it did to the church. And then in the early 70s, when our church just grew so fast, hundreds of people coming to the Lord, literally, literally. I had over 100 weddings in, in four or five years, and they were all new converts, young people. And uh, I, I knew I couldn't do it alone. I needed, I needed to walk with others to make that happen. And so that, 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 that desire, that longing for horizontal, I, I didn't have a word. John gave me the vocabulary, but it, it, it made my soul right, my heart right. And ready for, for for that covenant with John. And so the the nineteen seventies that was the 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 Jesus movement was it? Yeah, it was kind of in our case. Uh, we're a little rural, a little little further from from the city in those days. Uh, more 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 rural than now. And it was really kind of a culmination of both the Jesus movement and the charismatic. So you had a lot of young people coming. I mean, some right off the street. This just just a mess. Runs the whole thing. And we had a lot of other uh, adults, many of them old enough to be my parents, who were coming from the denominational churches. Our Sunday night service was larger than our Sunday morning service because there were so many people hungry who would still go to the other churches, but they didn't come to our church in the evening. And uh, they'd ask, should, we leave, should I leave my church and come to the to, 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 to I said, no, you don't have to do that. I knew that they would get kicked out anyway. It's only a matter of time. And, so, and maybe they could take some of the fire back with them. But that, that was really this crossroads. Uh, it, it was amazing. I mean, I thought it was normal, but it was just an amazing period of time. It, it made me more and more desperate. I need to find a better way. I cannot do this, this pyramid thing. Me at the top and, and, and a board under me. I, I knew, I knew. I watched three men fail. I knew I could not, I couldn't do that to the kingdom of God. Wow. Um, I think we need, we need to wrap up for this, this session, as I suspected we didn't get too far through the questions, but this is just, this is gold that you, that you're giving us here. It's, uh, I don't know, my, my heart's singing just hearing your stories and, 